Uh, this is not an appropriations committee, but it's a broad topic, and so if you don't mind, um, uh, Dr. Collins, again, great respect for you and for your institute, but as I've pointed out in the past, we don't seem to have an NIH which targets funding relative to disease burden. So when I look at NIDH, NIDA, their budget only went up 2% last year, and it still remains far smaller than other institutes uh, in which there is far less morbidity and mortality flowing from those disease conditions. So if we are going to address the issues of opioids or mental health, uh, both of which are playing into this, it seems like there has to be a greater shift in where our funding is going at NIH towards these disease conditions. Now, in the past, you've suggested that, well, we'll kind of organically grow, hold this one stable, and allow this one to grow. But when I look at it, all the institutes seem to be growing at about the same pace. So I guess my question for you is, is it doesn't seem as if NIH is making these a priority if you look over other conditions, if you look at the relative funding increase of those institutes. You're a very thoughtful person. So, so please give me your thoughts on that. Well, Senator, you point to a very important issue about how do we make decisions. I have to point out, however, that it's the Congress that assigns a budget as a line item every year in the appropriations process to each of those institutes. As the NIH director, I don't get to set those numbers, and so we follow what the Congress tells us ought to be the appropriation for a given year. And then we work with great flexibility to try to be sure that when there is a public health need, as there is now, for instance, with opioids, which I think you're referring to, because, of course, we have a big uh, opportunity there in terms of our understanding of how the brain works. The brain initiative is directly relevant here. The Neurology Institute has an enormous investment in understanding pain, as does the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. So one shouldn't look at our organizational structure and say that the money actually fits precisely into those buckets. We have lots of ways that we can mix. And I accept that, if I may, just because yep. I have limited time. Um, so, so you're saying that if we want more money to go to the National Institute of Drug Addiction, we need to line item it in our budget. That's the only way it happens. So uh, that said, um, the flexibility does seem as if it should be flexing towards things like NIDA. Pain is important, but ultimately pain translates into addiction. That's the final po common pathway. Mm -hmm. And so it does seem as if we should be flexing towards them. Is that where the flexing is taking place? I think that's what we're trying to do is to shift with the priority opportunities we have uh, more funds into that space because we recognize this is a terrible public health emergency. So let, me, you, so, so let me ask on this, a different topic, again, trying to stay on time. There is um, a, a move afoot to suggest that marijuana usage is, can be used in lieu of opioids that mm -hmm. states that uh, have legalized marijuana more liberally have lower incidence of opioid addiction. That's right. But then I read about the brain being pretty plastic up until age 25. Mm -hmm. And so, and we all know the pothead, the kid that has uh, a motivational syndrome, if you will. Uh, so, so there's been at least one suggestion I've read that we should make a recommendation that legalization of marijuana should be restricted to those 25 and above. Uh, and I say this not because I'm an expert, but to get the thoughts of those such as the two of you who are so expert. Well, there is published data, although it's still controversial, that heavy use of marijuana beginning in adolescence does have permanent consequences in terms of intellectual performance, that IQ points get lost in those individuals who have been uh, being exposed a lot to marijuana starting in adolescence. Um, it is also true, as you said, that there seems to be a statistical relationship between the states that have legalized marijuana and a reduced incidence of opioid overdoses and deaths. But one has to be careful there. That's a correlation and not necessarily a causation. I would not want to leap to that. I would just go, though, to the point that we are increasingly studying the cannabinoid receptor pathway in the brain as a potential way that we might come up with alternatives that would be effective for managing pain and depression and anxiety, not but, marijuana itself, but using that pathway. Except that, but for the two of you, is it a reasonable public policy consideration that perhaps the age of legal marijuana for those states that are legalizing should be 25 and above? We're getting into difficult public policy territory. I will simply say the concerns about marijuana exposure to the developing brain would have to be strongly considered in, in anything that made access uh, to adolescence more readily available, because we do have that concern. And the brain is developing at least through age 25. You could say 22, you could say 25. I don't know if I have a precise dividing line. My wife says it's 60, but that's, uh, you know. Uh, and Dr. Gottlieb, I'm out of time. I'm sorry, I should yield back. I apologize.